Sometimes we do before time because the subject requires more time. And I also require one or two minutes more because I want to brief you what's happening in the MMA next uh, few days so that you don't miss them. Because some of our emails are going to spam, I believe, so that you have to pull out and you know decode it and is it not spam, then only it will come to your inbox. We also welcome all the viewers watching this program live, wherever you are uh, from your own comfort. But we miss you. Start coming to MMA. I can assure you we'll have uh, meet some wonderful uh, friends and colleagues, a good networking place. But I can also assure you lovely refreshments what we give in MMA. Don't miss it. Uh, the next event is happening on the 17th of uh, June. Uh, it's again very, very interesting event. Uh, India's IT revolution, uh, the Maverick uh, thing, we're also having a discussion on uh, trillion dollar digital economy. Uh, we have got some outstanding speaker, uh, Narayan Murthy. You all know him. Narayan Murthy is founder chairman of Infosys. Uh, he is going to be delivering the keynote address. Then we have uh, Arsh Mehta and uh, Mr. Ramani, who is a vice chancellor of Sai University. Lashwin Narayan, former Cognizant, and Rajesh Nambia is the managing director, CMD uh, of uh, Cognizant India. So we have got some outstanding people. We are going to discuss all about IT, how IT has got revolution and NASCOM, how it has come and changed the whole view and how organized such will help. So please, uh, it's happening in, in person at MA Management Center. We already have 200 plus nominations registered. Please do register in case you would like to come and attend this in person. Then on 23rd uh, July, again an in, uh, interesting event. Where from here, the $5 trillion economy, because uh, with the dream of uh, our Honorable Prime Minister, where are we? Because the pandemic has really impacted, it's taken it back for some time. But still, are we in the right track? And we have got some, again, outstanding panelists. We'll be discussing Mr. M.R. Shivaraman. He's a former Revenue Secretary. IAS retired. He will be there. And Arun Kumar, I know you must have seen his article regularly in Hindu. Daddy Wala, you must have seen. Very good, very uh, good analytical thinking. He writes so beautifully about the issues and policies. Uh, he is going to be talking to us. He is from JNU, New Delhi. We have Mr. K. Kumar. K. Kumar is a senior partner, leader of consumer industrial products and is head of Deloitte in terms of businesses. He is with us. Uh, and uh, also Mr. Satyamurti, who is also policy matters, will be joining us to lead the conversation. Then on Friday, 24th July, again, we have an interesting event. We do an event on read and grow because we strongly believe if you're not a reader, you're not a leader. So we are trying to inculcate the habit of reading amongst our members. This program is very popular. A lot of people come and attend. We pick up some very interesting topic where the panelists come and discuss and how, how we can assimilate and keep it in yourself and how it helps you grow in whatever field you are. Uh, we have a topic of discussion is start with why, how great it is inspire everyone to take action. So, very interesting. We have outstanding panelists. Babu Krishnamurti, I think I'll walk a mile to listen to him. Very clear thought leader, investment consultant. is Then Rajesh Balaji Ramachandran is a partner of uh, Catalyst. And also Vijay Prabha Kamara Kara is a, again founder CEO of uh, Story Trails India Private Limited. These are the panelists. Please don't miss it. Then another interesting event I want you to uh, really attend on 25th June. We are having a one-day conclave on reimagining businesses in New India. It's a paid program. Sometimes we also do paid program and sometimes you must also attend paid program. You will really like it because they are very good. I can tell you. We've got some outstanding sessions. Uh, just to name a few, uh, uh, we have a very interesting person who is inaugurating and delivering a keynote address. Sri Sunil Mathur is the Director General of Income Tax Investigations, uh, Tamil Nadu and Puducherry. Then we have a number of sessions, uh, re-engineering conventional business using technology. We have again outstanding speakers. Then make an India story for the next decade. Then we have a brand building for success. Uh, Vijay Parsadi, one of the outstanding thought leader in brand, is going to be talking to us. We have a session on tax technology, current and future trends. Uh, uh, we also have another session on stock market opportunities in alternative investment. I don't know how many of you know what is alternative investment. Because with the interest rates coming down and uh, alternative investment was, was the domain of only rich and uh, wealthy. Now it can be brought down to the normal people like us also because they join as a group and group investment makes this investment very, very attractive. So we have experts who come and speak uh, on this so that you have avenues. I'm not telling you, you must go to alternative investment, do that. But ultimately you have some knowledge about this in case you can take a very conscious and very uh, this decision based on scientific method so that you today the way the interest is coming down the way inflation is going up you need a constant income i think this is some of the ways you can do that but i'm not telling you go and invest your every money in equity or uh, you know bitcoin or other thing and get into trouble i'm not telling that understand our not thinking to share the knowledge 
you take the call what to do later then uh, we also have a emerging technology driven business growth that's again the last but not the least we have a very interesting session on transition of family business to next generation the integrity and nuances of what's happening because family business get into trouble next generation it goes and how we should start planning uh, to pass the baton now we should really professionalize your family business so we are, this is a very interesting event is a paid program it costs almost 4000 for mma members we already have 2000 plus registration 200 plus registration we have for this already book because we are doing with another august in uh, the we have doing this uh, with Yeah, another interesting organization in chennai i know you know of them this is um, uh, called rajasthan uh, metro roa metro so it's all more business related people who are joining us together we are charging mma members only 1000 rupees plus tax just the cost of the food and admin arrangements and we are also giving some uh, very very attractive delicate kit so do come uh, do network uh, we have some outstanding people we also lined up program for entertainment of june we had done i just mentioned to you we also program for july some important program which you must mark in your calendar this fourth we have a kg work is endowment lecture followed by dinner then sixth we have uh, uh, again a conclave on sixth we have you must come and attend that then 8th july in fact i want you to block your diary 8th of july is mma agm and uh, we have some outstanding speaker c k ranganathan will be the chief guest we have one of the keynote speaker uh, who will be coming and talking on the subject uh, we have a mma award function that day and followed by mma agm do come and uh, that's a time we showcase uh, what we have done over the year and how we have been able to make bring in a lot of changes and how we adapted to technology and uh, everything goes well we also plan to launch a couple of new initiatives what you have done every agm we do that uh, we do some new initiatives and uh, which we do and showcase and launched on important occasions we have some surprise for you come and join us on agm we'll have some new technology initiatives what mma will be launching on that day then uh, that's on 8th of july please do come on 30th of july ganga priya chakravarti will be talking she's head of ford uh, chennai operations and uh, we have number of events then read and grow is there on 16th we have uh capacity building for ngos so we are lined up program for the entire month again for i'll stop with july i know you have come to listen to very very important event uh, today and which is uh, why you are here i don't want to take your time that's why i started 5 minutes before time still i gone so still i got 4 minutes of mind let me tell you what's happening today uh this is a topic when air marshal martinishan spoke to me i can honestly tell you i didn't understand what he talking about <laughs> then i said when i put my thought into that this is a subject which is very very vital today very very important because you sent me the theme note after reading that i understood my god how ignorant i know this subject but how ignorant we are that you are not able to understand what's happening in this particular subject potential of genome editing actually and many time we are public what is it how do you pronounce genome your genomy your all all thing but i think i pronounce correctly genome <laughs> but is very important subject we have got we are indeed privileged blessed to have some outstanding speakers who will be talking so potential of genome uh, editing is food security health and surviving climate change this is what the team will they'll be discussing we have outstanding panelists and uh, i must tell you you're all lucky to listen to some of the outstanding speaker especially i must also tell you our chief guest for this evening who will be setting the contest and presenting the team address is Dr Chandrasekhar is a professor emeritus uh, John Hopkins University Baltimore USA uh, thank you sir for joining us this evening we have again equally a good and air marshal mathersharan i mean he doesn't need introduction to mma dear friend of ours and uh, we do some is also proud and president of panisla foundation and we are doing some a lot of events together uh, air marshal mathersharan is leading the conversation again we have two young scientists who have done some phenomenal work in this field uh, is uh, dr judy gopal is a professor of research uh, Savita University and Manikandan Muthu, Associate Professor of Research and Innovation from Savita University. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hand together to welcome our distinguished guest for this evening. May I request you please to take your place on the dais, sir. Come, sir. Yes, I think there is a, there's a big round of applause. They are they are going to talk some subject which we are all alien. We really do not know. I think we will become more wisdom, more wiser by the time you step out of this hall to know about this subject. After listening to this gentleman, you will know how important this subject is. 
Uh, Air Marshal Mathewson, I as I mentioned to you, is not new to this audience, but it's always a privilege to introduce a colleague of mine, a veteran from armed forces, veteran from the Air Force. Uh, Air Marshal Mathewson was an Indian Air Force veteran for more than 13 years of service and uh, he is the founder president of uh, Peninsula Foundation, uh, a policy research think tank based in Chennai. He is very passionate about, uh, we already done a couple of events jointly with them. And he is a fighter pilot uh, and an experimental test pilot and a fighter combat leader and has flown over 40 types of aircraft. Somebody who would not know test pilot school uh, there in Bangalore, AST we call them. Some of the finest pilots in the Air Force are selected to lead that and he was a commanding AST really to do a testing of all the aircraft to, to maneuverability and operations and he was head of that. That requires a big round of applause because he's such a combat leader. Air Marshal also has a master's degree in military science, MPhil, PhD and defense strategic studies uh, from the University of Madras. And he has also done a senior fellowship from National and International Security from the Harvard Kennedy School uh, Governance and Harvard uh, University. Air Marshal is a recipient of uh, President Award, uh, Adi Visit Seva Medal, uh, then also Vice Sena Medal VM, and also commendation multiple couple of times from Chief IOS staff. Very warm welcome to Air Marshal. Now the format of this program is Air Marshal will set the context, introduce the speakers, Thereafter, uh, the keynote address will be delivered by Dr. Chandrasekhar, who is from John Hopkins University. Thereafter, other two gentlemen, lady and gentlemen, will also join us, share their insight. Uh, thereafter, there will be a discussion. And if you have any questions, please do, uh, at the end of the day, the mic will be passed on to you. Please share your questions uh, so that, you know, it will be nice, not your comments or thing, lectures and other things. If you want to talk to them something differently, the speakers are really available for you for interaction with you at the post even. Uh, we want you to relate your questions only to the topic what we are discussing and really appreciate your understanding. And one more request, please put your telephones uh, to silent mode. Uh, normally I don't remind our members are real gentlemen and uh, they don't do that. But I thought some, once in a while to remind them which is always good so that some by by mistake, you, you know, fail to put off the thing. It really disturbs the flow of the speaker. That's the idea. Because the gentleman has come from USA. We must show how disciplined we are in India too. What you miss, Air Marshal Mathieu said. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here at MMA. And the Peninsula Foundation is ever thankful for uh, the excellent support we get from MMA and KAS on various events that we've held so far, very interesting events, and we will continue to do many more as well. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here this evening, and, and, and I'm doubly happy because I'm hosting uh, Professor S. Chandra Segaran, who also happens to be my classmate, schoolmate, and uh, Professor Emeritus at uh, Johns Hopkins University on to talk on his passion, very important subject uh, on biotechnology, which is about genetic engineering and genome editing, which let me uh, inform to the audience that he is the inventor of zinc finger nucleus genome editing. And that was done in the late 1990s. He headed a laboratory while doing his PhD, he trained under Nobel laureate, Dr. Hamilton Smith, right? And uh, he then headed a laboratory in Johns Hopkins University. I visited there quite often and uh, developed the genome editing technology. The, the, the ZFN is a costly process, but taking a lead from him, there are many other researchers who developed the subsequent versions which became uh, more affordable technologies, which is Talon and, and CRISPR-Cas9 that you would have heard of, for which two ladies won the Nobel Prize last year. Logically, it should have gone to him. Well, uh, so this is an extremely important subject. Along with him, we are privileged to have uh, uh, two young scientists, uh, Dr. Judy Gopal and her husband and scientist, uh, Dr. Manikandan Muttu. Both have worked excellently well abroad. They spent more than a decade in Taiwan and in Korea. And they are biotechnologists with multidisciplinary approach. And therefore, they will bring in a rich, you know, uh, 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 inputs through their experience and discussions for today's discussions. Uh, their uh, detailed biodata is available. 
Dr. Judy Gopal has worked in, uh, in the Kalpakam Atomic Energy uh, uh, Department and on a material and biotechnology interface related doctoral program. And uh, Dr. Manikandan has worked more closely towards the agriculture related biotechnology and of course interdisciplinary approach as well. Both have an you know, enormous, research, enormous research experience and they are currently with Savita University with whom we have an MOU signed just last month. Well, the subject as I said is extremely important because 21st century is going to be dominated by three important characteristics. One is the uh, big data or IT or digital technology. Second, artificial intelligence and robotics. And third, and the most important one that's going to take center stage as we move along the 21st century is biotechnology. It's already doing that. And therefore, while Gripkar and Vijay Kumar said not many are aware of genome editing, it's important that people become aware of it. Right now in India, the knowledge is all about the controversies that have been raised with respect to the use of Monsanto's best cotton, Bt cotton, and its linkage to the farmer suicides, etc., the seed monopoly and uh, terminator technologies, etc. These have been in the news and most would have read about that. The, there is a difference between genome, mo genetic modified organisms and genome editing. And that difference is what we are going to actually look at one. And what does that do? If you change fundamental DNA characteristics by inserting a foreign gene into the structure, does that become GMO? And if you are actually addressing an error or a, or a problem in the existing gene by through a synthetic genome editing, then that retains the existing DNA and continues to functionally evolve as naturally other organisms evolve over a much longer period. And, and what does this offer to the country? In the 1960s, India looked at ships from America that brought in PL 480 assist, 470 assistance, and poverty was endemic. And we addressed that through what's known as the Green Revolution. 50 years down the line, the Green Revolution has raised new questions. While our food production has grown enormously, we are now exporting grains and uh, but at the same time we've we are guilty of using excessive amounts of fertilizers chemical fertilizers which has led to a lot more problems and therefore today many families in urban areas are looking to buy organic vegetables because there is a general prevalence of opinion and belief that the regular agricultural product is contaminated by chemicals it has led to greater incidences of diseases like cancer. And therefore, there's a lot of suspicion in people's mind. How do we address all this? Does genome editing offer a great solution? Addressing better yield, higher yield, retaining biodiversity, and, and not venturing into areas that could be seen as dangerous and creating more problems here. And this is the most important area that probably that needs to be answered. The biggest question is, is genome editing safer, better, and more productive, particularly for food industries and farmers? And this is a question that needs to be, you know, examined and knowledge needs to be spread out. So without taking any more time, let me invite Dr. Chandrasegaran to deliver his lecture. And thereafter, we'll move in with the panel discussion. Thank you. I want to thank Matesh 
and Jay Kumar for inviting me, the TPF Foundation and uh, MMA for organizing this talk. It's a pleasure to be here. Like uh, Mate said, we go a long way back. Uh, back in Sainik School, Amaravajinagar, we are classmates. We grew up together, okay? Especially wearing hard khakis <laughs> and in a hard climate. I'm wearing khaki today, by the way, okay? I just want to talk to you a little bit about genome editing, revolution in life sciences, and I want to, just to make sure, disclosure, all the opinions discussed here are my own. It does not belong to Hopkins or anybody else. Okay? So it, they are my personal views. Uh, uh, I am fully retired from Hopkins. I retired in 2021. I retained an honorary appointment as Professor Emeritus there. So that's why I disclose here. Okay. And it all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we got started into this. What is genome editing? How we got started in early, how my lab got started into it what we have done with regard to health. Then I'm going to ask uh, my junior colleague who is actually working in my brother's company, biotechnology company. Okay, they are doing some interesting research. So he's going to give about 10 minutes talk. Okay, so that's how I planned the talk. Okay, what is genome editing? It's also known as gene editing because let's say there is a mistake in a gene and you get a disease. What you want to do is some may go, correct that mistake, hopefully it will produce normal protein and you'll be fine. Okay? So we want to edit that mistake. Okay? That's what we want to do. Okay? It's called genome editing because we are doing it at the genome level in a cell. Okay? Some people refer to it as gene editing because we are targeting a particular gene to correct. Okay? So it's known, also known as gene editing. Okay. So whenever you take a bacteria culture, you add some donor DNA, it does two things. One, it can randomly integrate that piece anywhere within the genome or it can go to a site where it has a sequence similarity to the donor DNA and replace the genomic DNA with the donor. That's called homologous recombination, okay? In bacteria and yeast, the recombination, homologous recombination occurs at a very high rate, okay? So they are very useful from that regard. But once you come to mammalian cells, especially human cells, the, the homologous recombination takes place at only one per million treated cells. So it's a very rare event. So it's very hard to isolate those cells, okay? In my cells, which are slightly better, you can do it by positive and negative selection, isolate those corrected cells, okay? That was wh what was done by Mario Capecchi, for which he won the Nobel Prize, okay, a while back. Okay, from that corrected, he did that using embryonic, uh, mouse embryonic stem cells, so you can regenerate mice from those cells. So you can form transgenic animals. That's why that research became very important. What we wanted to do is correct a mutation within a human cell. Okay? So biologists have known for a while, if you want to stimulate homologous recombination, all you have to do is make a break at that locus. Okay? At that site. If you make a double standard break, you can stimulate recombination. So, uh, when you have a double standard break, the rec homologous recombination increases 1,000 to 10,000 fold, even 100,000 fold sometimes. 
So essentially the goal is to stimulate homologous recombination. So how do you do that? When you're talking about DNA, how do you break DNA? You're looking at molecular scissors. At that time we entered the research, there were no scissors available to make a precise cut within a genome. Remember, this genome, human genome is 3 billion base pairs. To make a precise cut, there are about 123,000 genes within the genome. And to make a precise cut at one place, you need high specificity. The restriction enzymes are the molecular scissors that bacteria produce, but they produce it to protect themselves. So these sequences occur more frequently. You can't use them for um, making gene targeting. So we said we, we had to come up with a way. So that's the problem we face, and we decided to approach that. So what happens when you have a double-stranded break? Okay, so the repair cells don't like the double-stranded break because the, all the information, your genome encodes the whole program uh, of the life cycle. So what you want to do is immediately patch up that break. So it tries to do it by two ways. One is through uh, non-homologous enjoining. What it does is just patches it up, okay? That process is uh, error prone. So it makes mutation. So you end up with a pool of mutations, okay? In the other case, you give the Ziffens, Talens, or CRISPR, you make the double-stranded break. At the same time, you give the donor. As long as your donor DNA has homology on either side of the break, it will integrate whatever donor you have into the genome and correct, okay? But you can also introduce whole genes as long as they have homology I need to know pointer, right? No pointer? Okay. Yeah. As long as there is homology on either side, it can integrate the whole gene. When you do that, this, this is, you can introduce novel function or you can introduce novel traits. This becomes GMO. If you are just disrupting the gene, you are knocking out the function. It's a loss of function. That's non-GMO. At least that's how FDA characterizes. So when we started the work, we had to make a molecular scissors that cut Okay, I'm used to. Let me do it here. Is this the same thing? I can't go back. Okay, so when we came to the research, what we did was, we looked at this enzyme, this is called a folk one. So we said this enzyme has two parts, one for recognizing the GGATG sequence, so that will, it has a DNA binding domain, the other one has a cleavage domain. That does not recognize any sequence at the cleavage site, okay? So the idea was, you have two parts, it's linked together by a linker, you can separate the two. Then you can replace the recognition part with a designer enzyme. That, so we want that uh, new DNA binding protein should be something where we can control the specificity. So at that time, we chose this protein, zinc finger protein. It's an anti-parallel beta sheet with the alpha helix, which is held together by a zinc atom. And this zinc atom coordinates its two cis amino acid residues and two his residues, okay? And it's in a compact form. And the business end of the molecule is actually at the amino 
amino terminus, okay? Those make the base pair contacts. Each of these motifs recognize three bases, okay? Three to four bases. There are only 64 possible tri triplets in DNA. So if you have 64 of these modules, we thought you can, like beads, you can collate them, make them recognize a big site, then you can fuse it to the nucleus domain and make a new protein. That will be, by making a long recognition site, you can make it cut very specifically at a, uh, within a genome. So this is what the next slide shows you, you know, how the recognition takes place. Usually they recognize the primary strand, the recognition, the amino acid contact the primary strand. If you have aspartic acid at two position, they make a cross strand. So if you don't have it, we thought without aspartic acid at two, you should be able to have 64 possible zinc finger motifs. So you can mix and match, make them recognize long side, then take that, fuse it with the FOC1 nucleus domain, and make a new enzyme. It turns out you can do that. You can, here you have three of the modules linked together and they recognize a nine base pair site. Three zinc fingers recognize nine base pair. Since they all have aspartic acid, there is one more contact. So actually recognizes 10 base pairs, okay? Did it work? Yes, otherwise I won't be here talking about this. So we made two of these. two three zinc finger proteins. Actually, it's shown on the right hand side. You can see lane three, where you are taking, purifying the protein and cutting the lambda DNA and running it on agarose gel. You can see two smaller bands. Then on lane four, you see two different bands. Again, two smaller bands. So we use two different specificities. So these enzymes work. Actually, we are even luckier than that. What happened was, of course, if you want to be, it to be very specific, to make a specific cut within a genome, you need about 18 base pair recognition, okay? So that, because just uh, doing the probability, four raised to the power of 18, it becomes very rare within the genome. Uh, the, it turns out that FOC1 nuclease domain has to dimerize to cleave. It has to make, it, it has to dimerize to cleave. That meant it's a inverted repeat is the best substrate for this enzyme. So that immediately makes it 18 base pair. So it's a rare, so we can use this to make rare cuts within a genome. Of course, the other advantage is you can use, also cut a heterologous site by giving two different zinc, that's shown on C. Okay. Now, fine. We showed that this all works well within test tube. Then we had to test it. Does it really do genome editing within? So we tested it using a model system in frog oocytes, frog eggs. So what we did was we made a plasmid which contained two TED genes in the same orientation. It's a small molecule. So you can easily isolate from the cells. It has a unique site, so you can linearize it and analyze it in gel. So you take that plasmid, inject it into the frog oocyte, wait it, wait for four to six hours. It will form chromatin structure. Then you inject your zinc finger nucleus, which we created. So you can do only two things. One, it can cut or it doesn't cut. If it doesn't cut, when you isolate and linearize, you should get a 5.6 kb fragment on a agarose gel. And if it cuts, if nothing else happens, you should get two fragments, 3.6 and 2 kb fragment. But there is one other possibility, because you have TED genes in the same orientation, they can undergo recombination, homologous recombination, because sequence similarity between two TED genes are 100%. So they can recombine and give you one copy. When you linearize, you'll get a smaller band. And that's what this uh, next uh, slide shows. You can see the uncut is the substrate when nothing happens. 
when recombines you can see that you get this smaller fragment okay so it shows two different enzymes one as qq inverted repeat when you had that q enzyme you get the smaller recombined product rec as shown then you have the kk uh, substrate then you had a k enzyme again that recombines you can then you have a heterologous site then you had only q it doesn't undergo recombination then you have a again heterologous you add the other enzyme it doesn't undergo but when you add both enzyme it undergoes recombination so this was the first experiment which says you can make use zipfens to do genome editing okay the when we did more and more work one of the problems came up the problem was zipfens we also saw were very toxic the reason for them to be toxic was many of the modules reported in literature don't exactly recognize nine base pairs many times they recognize only two bases as shown in zip1 and zip3 in the next slide right the center base is not recognized so they can be any one of the four so that leads to off target effects so one of the things you really have to do is you have to choose your zip modules which are with high specificity if you don't do it you'll run into trouble okay there are a lot of ways to avoid this one is to just increase the length increase the number of modules it will recognize a bigger sequence it will be more specific then other way is also if you want to avoid cutting it uh, inverted repeats which can happen within the genome for the enzymes so you can do that by creating a, a heterodimer site okay at the focon interface that's been done and that's been published now i want to show you here here these are the applications that came out of zipfens genome editing okay this was till 2012 all these things which were not possible before became possible after the development of zipfens 2012 guess what crispr came in so actually zipfens established the laid the foundation for genome editing crispr came and made it easier so after zipfens which was we did it in 1966 1996 talens came in 19 talens is very similar to zinc fingers uh, because talen is a different dna binding module they are also similar size to zinc fingers but they recognize only one base so all you need is four different modules so you can mix and match then again they also fused it to folk one it forms the same st strategy as folk one okay but unfortunate for talens two years later crispr came so in this case of uh, zipfens and talens you had to do protein engineering which is very difficult to do okay so that's why it's very costly so for making one uh, in the early days to target one gene it cost about $10000 when talon came in it dropped to 5000 when crispr came it dropped to $50 so that's the difference okay in the case of crispr the, the protein is always the nucleus is always the constant the target recognition is done by rna Uh, right the target site is pulled apart and the rna makes the recognition where it's shown by n n n on the top i always having problem any on the by the rna it's called guide rna that does the target recognition okay but as guide rna is very easy to make you can order them okay you can order the dna put it in a plasmid which then you can make the rna very easily then there was a explosion everybody wanted to use this that's how for that work uh, doudna and sharpentier were awarded the nobel prize 
for harnessing Cas9 to do genome editing. Okay. Now, these are some examples of how genome editing has been used. Here is one on the top A panel shows edited white button mushrooms. Okay. I don't know if you guys are, if you are all peeled potato and leave it out, after some time it will become very dark black. After a while you don't feel like eating them. Okay. So what they did here was to avoid that, they knocked out polyphenol oxidase. It's an enzyme within there. Okay. And there are six isoforms. They knocked out one of them. So now the mushroom doesn't darken. Okay, so it's very sumptuous, you want to cook and eat it. The second one was done by the flower. The flower on the right hand side, violet, is produced by anthocyanin gene. Okay, so the, it produces the pigment, that gene produces the pigment. What they, this is Japanese glory morning, Japanese morning glory flower. So the Japanese scientists targeted the anthocyanin gene and knocked it out. Then from that you can see it becomes a white flower. Okay? So it doesn't produce the pigment anymore, so it becomes a white flower. Okay? Then you have the cow here. Okay? So beef industry is a big thing in US. Okay? A lot of people eat beef and when you have cows have horns, they hurt workers that can become a big lawsuit and they can also hurt other cows so you don't want them. What they do in the old days is pull out the horns, okay, which is very bloody and messy. Now you do it in embryo, okay. They knock out the pole locus, okay, it's a locus, uh, a chromosomal locus uh, which has a, which gives rise to the sound. So if you make a small deletion there, it doesn't produce the horns anymore. Otherwise, the cows are uh, sad looking, but they are all very healthy, right? And on the other, uh, the last slide, D, I saw there are two snails. So if you take the snail on the right hand side, it's a right handed screw. If you look at the shell, it's a right handed screw. That's because it has a gene called LSDAA1. So some scientists knocked out that gene. Okay, when they knock it out, you can see the, its progeny on the left. It, is, it has a left-handed spiral. The shell is a left-handed spiral. It's a left-handed screw. Okay, so you can, by targeting one gene during development, you can change the whole body plan. Okay, and you can see why is this so important. Actually in humans you can have organs, there are some instances where organs are rearranged, right? So these can help in those studies. Now my lab after doing that, I am at the medical institutions, so I used to be, sorry, retired now. So, uh, I surrounded colleagues who are all interested in medicine. So I, my thinking was all, how do we use this technology for correcting disease correction? So we thought we'll go through this way. The idea is uh, take, a, if there is a mutation which causes a disease, can we correct it, all right? So that's what we wanted to do. So we chose, uh, we want to do it in stem cells so you can put it back, uh, take a patient, take his own cells, take his own cells, then correct it and put it back. So it's autologous transplantation. So you don't have any immune re rejection or any other problem such as that. So what we wanted to do was, we took three diseases, sickle cell disease, uh, which has a mutation, which has, where in the, Beta globin gene, there is a mutation, GAG is converted into GTG, which changes the amino acid, glutamic acid to valine. Okay? That affects the hemoglobin, sickles, that makes the cell sickle. That's your red blood cells sickle. They clog together and can block arteries. So that's a serious disease. 
it's very common in uh, african uh, but also in india it's quite pretty common i think then we have addressed the second di- disease which is a gauche's disease it's a lysosomal storage disease which affects white blood cells so it affects their mobility okay so if the enzyme is uh, mutated they can't move so you can't fight uh, all infections and other things so it can be really bad and of course third one is the most difficult one is cystic fibrosis but our lab has only addressed them in the lab we have not can we do them so the approach we took was very simple you take the cell but usually somatic cell which is differentiated cell you can edit them but they won't survive too long so you have to do keep on doing them so what we thought is take the somatic cell reprogram into a induced pluripotent stem cell this is using yamanaka's work for which he won the nobel prize and uh, then you do gene editing then you differentiate it into the right human stem progenitor cells and infuse it back into the uh, patient that's what we want them to do can we convert them into can you take the differentiated cell like take your fibroblast from your skin convert them into a uh, human induced pluripotent cells we could do it you can see cystic fibrosis is converted into cfhipas see the top panel shows differentiated cells when they become induced pluripotent they become like a bag of cells and you can see all the four we put all four stem cell factors into those differentiated cells and reprogram reprogram into pluripotent stem cells okay and we show after reprogramming we remove all those factors then once reprogram they stay reprogram okay now then we do the editing so we did that so it shows you on this panel on your left below the gel graph you can see scd ipsc you see only gtg only t is there that red line okay uh, that's a sequence trace so you can that sequence is only t when you see on the right hand side you see cre2e you can see two colors red and green where you have t and a so we each cell has two copies one from came from the father the other from the mother so you have corrected one of them one only okay so they are corrected and the bottom panel shows they remain then we differentiate we show that it produces erythrocytes then we look at how well the look for hbg globin expression by rt pcr you can see in the sickle cell you don't express almost nothing is expressed when you correct one allele you get 100 fold increase in the expression of beta globin of course if you correct both copies you'll get complete expression so gauche's disease this is also i told you the second one we worked on there are three types of manif- manifestations of disease type 1 is very low it's not very serious type 2 is the most serious form type 3 and type 2 give neurological function this is what the enzyme does it actually breaks down glucosyl ceramide and glucosyl sphingosine into ceramide and glucose and sphingosine then they are recycled back if you don't do that if the enzyme is defective then your lys- lysosomes don't function so your cells cannot move so if you guys you know white blood can't move then you can't fight infection and it damages your liver okay so the same strategy we take gd fibroblast uh, we make induced pluripotent cells we correct them then we differentiate in macrophages and look at them again coming to the right panel here you can see dg gdhipas you see ccg 
this is, this is a sequent trace. When we correct one allele, one copy is corrected. You see both of them T and C. Then we also have both corrected, bi allele corrected. You have, right? Just both corrected. What does it do to the actual transcripts? You can see on the left panel here, RTQ PCR GKS transcript, macrophages. We are looking at mac there is hardly any transcript. When you have one allele corrected, you produce almost tenfold more. Then you have maximum production and both are corrected. Then you can see the protein also. Western actual enzyme production, you can see when you have corrected, you have produced a lot of it. So what are the challenges with genome editing? Genome editing, the big problem is soft target cleavage. Okay. So they can cut somewhere else. Although you can correct, you don't want it to do. It's like a knife when surgeon is, you know, doing his operation. If he cuts it somewhere else, you're in trouble, right? Same thing through here. So when you do genome surgery, you want it to be very precise. But there is off-target cleavage in all the three tools, okay? And also efficiency of cleavage is low still very low. So we need further improvement. We have to develop more safe and efficient delivery. Not all cells work well. Some cells work better than others. Okay? Different methods, talents give it different results, Ziffens give different result, CRISPR gives different result. Of course, the last one is most important. Right now, this is a low estimate. Per treatment, it's about $1 million. I don't think many of us can afford it, right? So the high estimate is $2 million per treatment. So, of course, in the autosomal recessive disorders, recessive diseases, you have to have both copies of the gene. For a person to have a disease, both copies have to be mutated, okay? So all you need to do is correct only one copy, then the person will be fine. In the, by, in the case of dominant disorders, both copies, all you have to do is have one copy mutated, you'll have the disease. So when some person has biallele mutation, you have to correct both of them. That biallele correction is even more difficult, okay? The biggest controversy about genome editing is this one. Human embryos. Should we to edit or not to edit human embryos? USA may, is, in USA, genome editing of human embryos is strictly prohibited. Okay? No, not allowed. You can't even create embryos to do the research using federal funds. Okay? Uh, then, of course, you'll have all the other. My personal view, it will eventually happen. Maybe not this decade, may not next decade, maybe 50 years down the line, it will happen sometime. Okay? The other problem you have is people wanting to do cosmetic changes. That is not good because whenever you do uh, changes in embryo, you are talking about future generation. Right? It will be passed on to your progeny. You don't want that. In the therapies I talked about, you are taking that patient, you are doing everything to that patient, you are affecting only one person. So that's not a big deal. But if you are going to affect all future generation, you have to think carefully. So, but that has to, not just to do cosmetic changes. If the, the like I said, uh, U.S. National Academy of Sciences has made it clear it should be done in only more serious cases, only when an alternative is not available. Okay, but right now none is being done. Right now we don't have to worry. I'm sure some of you have seen these movies, Gataka and Boys from Brazil. Okay, genetically modified organism, organisms which are knocking out genes. They do not require U.S. FDA approval, okay, at least so far. So even that uh, polled locust, these cows without horns, they, they have 
you have seen cows with mini horns they arose about 500 to 1000 years back they are still being propagated but still they are pending i think in us organism the moment you put a novel function introduce a novel trait they all you have to get us fda approval i am not too familiar about indian thing i think that's where i'll stop if it were up to me i will i will set up a training center to train these two technologies i my lab has also worked on synthetic biology where we have synthesized soul chromosome some of you might have heard about sc2.0 synthetic is 2.0 so these two te- technologies are going to dominate next 50 100 years so if, if it were up to me i had a lot of funding i would train every high school student take them and expose them to these things okay and it's the future okay you have to have these uh, and, and also set up a good training center for genome editing focused on only genome editing and synthetic biology and bioinformatics okay i let uh, my colleague present about 10 minutes uh, what he has done at pbl in my brother's company relating to agriculture thank you sir i can just sit there no? Sorry, it was long. Yeah, Harry, so, please go. Good evening to all of you, and thank you, Professor Chandra, for this opportunity. I think from Professor Chandra's talk, you might have already known the basics of genome editing. I think from Professor Zandra's talk, you might have already known the basics of genome editing and he has already discussed about the potential applications of genome editing or gene editing in the field of medicine. But here I will be discussing about the work we were doing at Pondicherry Biotech Private Limited which was located in Pondicherry and here we are mostly working on the genome editing applications in plant systems. So the topic I will be discussing here is in vivo genome editing of Indian tomato plants. And the work was carried out by me and my junior colleague, Mr. Prakash, under the mentorship of Professor Chandra. So this is the basics of genome editing, how the genome editing uses the DNA repair process. As I think we have already discussed about this. When there is a double-stranded break in the cell, the cell's natural repair machinery uh, d- uh, organizes, the, sorry, d- the cell's natural repair machinery uh, uh, takes over the repair mechanism and there are like two repair mechanisms. One is the NHEJ based method that is non-homologous enjoining and the other method is the homology directed repair. So when you, when they, so if the natural repair, most, mostly the, more than 95 percent, the NHEJ method only occurs, whereas HDR is very, occurs very less frequently. So when there is NHEJ method, it tries to mix match. So it either inserts some bases or deletes some bases and then it ligates the DNA. So you will get a knockout function. So the knockout means the protein function will be knocked out. So mostly these are called as non-GMOs because we are not introducing any foreign gene or any gain of function mutation. When, whereas the whole HDR method requires a template which can be used for DNA repair. So either it's like a gain of function mutation. So you are introducing a new function. So this technique is called as GMO, that is genetically modified technique. And as, uh, as the title mentions, like we are working on the tomato plants. If you look at this picture, the first, the A, it's a domestic wild plant. It's called Solanum pimpeliformis. This is a very wild type. It was like thousand years before. And in the domestication process, the size of the tomato, if you look at this A to B, it gets increased. And this is the latest variety we are getting. So if you look at uh, the increase in size, so in the reverse genetic approach, the scientists have used the reverse genetic approach to find out which are the genes responsible for this increase in size. 
So if you look at the increase in size, so improving yield by increasing the size of produce is an important selection criterion during the domestication of fruit and vegetable crops. And it can be increased by using the now increasing the number of fruits also. These are the two approaches. So by reverse genetic approach, the scientists have identified some genes which are involved in the fruit development. So the genes are like LC, it's uh, responsible for locule number and FAS is for fasciated genes and ENO is the excessive number of floral organs. And these are the genes which are involved in fruit development. So uh, these are the naturally occurring FAS mutations which are observed in the tomato plants. So uh, what we have done at PVPL is, so we have identified a target gene and using a genome editing technique, so we have targeted a gene and then we looked for the phenotypes, fasciated phenotypes. So what is happening into the fruits? So the, if you look at this, this is the control plant where we have not done anything. So it's a control and this is, we, we have identified like a gene and then we have designed two target regions. So this is the target region one and this is the target region two and then we have used combined both the targets in a single construct. So if you look at the fruits, these are uh, taken from the field only. So these are uh, control fruits are like normal, whereas if you look at the target sites, the fruits got fasciated, fused. So th this is after harvesting. So if you look at the morphology, so compared to the control plant, you, here you have got lots of fasciated fruits, that's fused fruits, due to the disruption of the target gene. So if you look at, so when there is increase means it is due to the increase in the locule number as we discussed in the first slide. So we just look for the locule number, increase in locule number by using the target. So these are the control plants where you could able to see only there are like three to five locules in the control plant. Whereas in the mutant plant, the locule number got increased here, it is nine, 10 and 11. And in our experiment, this is the maximum number of locules we have got. I think it's around 17 locules here. And I have to emphasize that these results are like very preliminary and we have to do like uh, advanced research to confirm this and we have to proceed this to the next generations to check whether these characters are inherited to the further progenitors. And then so I, like we discussed about locule number, there is an increase in fruit count is also like an increase in fruit yield. So th uh, these are like, this is the control plant where we could able to see only few fruits and this is the target site one and target site two and then this is the compared. Whereas compared to control, control here in target site one and two, the fruits number count, fruit count got increased. So here it's, it's in the chart. So for example, if you look at the mean fruit number, plant, this is the control plant and this is target site one and this is target site two and then this is the combined one. So you could able to see that uh, the fruit number almost got tripled here. Actually, when I said in the title, it's Indian tomato plants, we have selected three varieties of Indian plants. One is like a Pusa Ruby from the Indian Agricultural Research Institute, IARI. And then second one variety is a PKM1 from the Tamil Nadu Agricultural University. And then one variety cherry tomato we got from online. So this fruit count is for the Pusa Ruby variety. And this is for the cherry variety and this is for the PKM. So we could able to reproduce the results where you could able to see in the target side too, the fruit number almost got doubled. And uh, we have already mentioned that these are like very preliminary results and then we have to prove that these results get inheritable in the subsequent generations like M1 and M2. Since the life, you look at the life cycle, it takes almost six months. So we started this, now we have the fruits. So like we are like uh, proceeding to the further generations. And then we need to establish the genetic basis of the results. So we have to confirm through the molecular analysis, like sequencing and other things. And we are also exploring the use of local algae for biofuel production and also a duckweed variety for biopharmaceuticals production. And we are also interested in developing herbicide resistant and salt tolerant rice. Like we are working on that using the genome editing approach. And this is our team working at Pondicherry Biotech, our professor Sandra as a mentor. And this is, uh, our president and CEO, Mr. Gunasegaran, and junior scientist, Mr. Prakash, our director, and then our lab was. Thank you. Thank you, Hari. Uh, come, uh, Dr. Muthu, and uh, Judy, come, yeah. Okay, the, it's been an excellent uh, long coverage, and uh, one of the uh, important things about uh, uh, the uh, genome editing and gen genetically modified organisms is that 
the laws and the regulations across the world for the very reasons that Dr. Chandrasekharan explained the challenges with respect to human use in you know, animals and, and human beings and for medical purposes have a lot of uh, you know, uh, issues related to control, ethics as well as challenges, medical challenges. And therefore, in most countries, as he pointed out about US, this is still a no-no. In India, it's completely not allowed. But for plants and agriculture, this is coming in in a big way. And I think, as uh, Hari pointed out, uh, as tests and uh, experiments go along, it needs time. And therefore, more data has to be generated to be able to become commercially viable for farmers as well as industrialists. So, in terms of regulations, the government of India brought out, it has very stringent regulations with respect to genome, genetically modified organisms for since 1980s. Very, very stringent. And the only, organ, only uh, GMO crop that was allowed is Monsanto's best cotton seeds, which is ultimately over 20 years, it's raised a lot of controversy right now. And therefore, they're quite, you know, cautious. But in March, they introduced new regulations in the context of new technology of genetic editing, genome editing developments. And therefore, the government has given very relaxed regulations with respect to what's known as uh, SDN1 and SDN2. These are ones where external DNAs are not introduced, external genes are not introduced into the thing. It's, it's only gene editing as explained by both uh, Dr. Chandrasekharan and Hari. And uh, genomes and instead it would rely on reports uh, instead of going through a bureaucratic pro and red tape procedure of, uh, you know, uh, a long uh, process of uh, clearances, these are being very relaxed rulings, which will allow the gene editing to be adopted immediately into, uh, into the agricultural industry. Uh, so this will help the breeders and researchers in a big way. Similarly, the US has, uh, has uh, relaxed it significantly. In 2019, seven crops were cleared, gene edited crops. In 2020, it's risen to 70. But European clearances are merged. They still deal and, and uh, consider gene-edited uh, organisms as equivalent to geno genetically modified organisms. And therefore, it is quite strict. So in this context, and with what uh, Dr. Chansen has covered, we'll invite comments from Dr. Muttu, who deals with uh, the agriculture significantly. He has his own test farm in Marakanam. He holds three patents in Taiwan in, uh, uh, to his name. And let's invite his comments, followed by Dr. Judy after that. So, um, good evening. About, to about six minutes each, that's right. Okay. So, good evening to you all. And um, I'm really happy to be part of this uh, uh, ceremony here, like uh, part, uh, to, to interact with Professor uh, uh, Chandra. And uh, also, uh, I'm happy to uh, be with uh, um, our uncle. Um, so, and also Dr. Judy and uh, um, Captain Vijay Kumar. So, very happy. And uh, actually, um, it is quite really fascinating me. Like uh, when we were uh, in masters, like we studied the textbook of uh, nucleases and all those things. And the real uh, people behind it, you know, to bring all those into limelight is here. So I'm interacting with uh, the eminent scientists. So it's really happy. And um, I'm coming to the uh, topic of uh, gene editing. Uh, as uh, both of uh, them uh, described about uh, the gene editing technology, um, bring it into, you know, field level is having a little difficulty uh, like um, we do not know how many generations since um, uh, it is mostly concentrated on single allele uh, process and we do not know uh, how far it will uh, you know resist to present in the organisms and how, how many generation is passed through uh, the same traits so uh, that difficulty we face and um, also you know uh, this, what I understand from their talk is, like this can be easily uh, hijacked by, uh, you know, uh, some of the people 
to create superbugs and that kind of things to spread it uh, to, to the society. Uh, so that there could be a possibility for that too. So these are the things uh, which came into my mind. And um, uh, the other thing is like um, the regulatory bodies. Is it really uh, as simple as we talk here? Like, uh, can we get the permission from the regulatory bodies? Because uh, I have come across, uh, you know, the government bodies. Uh, we have to undergo six kind of uh, six uh, bodies uh, permission to really bring about uh, uh, genetically modified or uh, genetically modified organisms. Uh, if we uh, uh, bring them with a good trait or uh, so on. Uh, so, we have in India six different bodies like uh, Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee, uh, Institutional Biosafety Committee, Review Committee on uh, Genetic Manipulation, uh, Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee, State Biotechnology Coordination Committee, District Level Committees. So, we have to pass through all this uh, in order to get uh, permission for a, a single, you know, uh, our achievement, in fact. So, these are all the difficulties uh, uh, we face here. In fact, what I did was, uh, uh, when I came from Korea, you know, the peanut sizes are twice the size of our uh, Indian peanuts. So, I am totally admired with those peanuts and I brought uh, some seeds, like um, it is uh, climate oriented, like those uh, uh, grow in a, a cold climate. And then when we uh, bring that to our uh, condition, it is very difficult, like I, I bought one kg seeds and out of it, like um, I got only two or three plants grow. So from that, I just uh, grown those uh, seeds, uh, plants, along with the plants uh, of our Indian varieties, indigenous varieties. So what happened was, like the next generation, I got so many plants with a very high yield, uh, the character is still retaining, but I'm literally confused and I am scared to get permission from all these uh, bodies. So, the process is still going are, on. Are they genetically modified? Or oh, it's genetically not genetically, but I suppose uh, uh, maybe uh, some crossbreeds, naturally, you know, uh, yeah, uh, natural crossbreeds. Um, I have to verify uh, the, you know, the genetic makeup, the genome of the uh, new peanut variety, which would be very useful for farmers. Uh, because one peanut uh, plant, may produce more than 130 parts of peanuts. It is amazing, you know, excellent result. But uh, I am I, literally confused to get uh, the permission from this. There are a lot of rules and regulations, uh, laws we have to oblige and uh, to, to bring it to the, uh, you know, farmers. So these are all the things uh, I come across and uh, also um, we need to, you know, see on the biodiversity perspective, like a system as a whole, the diversity as a whole can sustain itself. So, uh, we were told like uh, uh, the, 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 the Prosophis juliflora plant, people may know that it's a plant uh, 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 originated from uh, Cuba, still Cubans are, you know, using it for generating uh, energy, uh, like uh, power and all those things. But we, that was introduced to India, but it, it became invasive species now. So we cannot eradicate uh, those uh, plants from India. So what I suggest is uh, the, the biodiversity itself, you know, Establish organizes of its own, but when you when, when we, what we have to do is we have to thoroughly study before introducing any kind of GMOs or uh, any um, genetically modified organism through gene editing or anything. Thoroughly studied in the perspective of biodiversity, and uh, that is more important in my view. Uh, by considering all the species around it. So, if it become invasive, then it would be dangerous to the ecosystem and uh, it will 
it can even alter the climate also so uh, it should be taken care of that's what my uh, you know opinion here thank you thank you judy your comments hi and uh, so actually i thought um, it's more about in my case um, i thought i just comment on the theme which is running here uh, because i am really not a specialist on this and uh, i thought that it's a uh, general audience mostly so i thought i'll just comment on the theme so the first thing i also thought was uh, um like uh, air marshal yes. air marshal uh, uh, madheswaran uh, he said and also like they have all key interests also captain vijay kumar uh, they all said that uh, this is a term when uh, when i was i heard the term i was like shocked uh i uh, starting as a biologist for me when i heard this term i was shocked because this has started a bit later down the line far from when we did actual biology and we kind of like outgrow and everything and then so when we heard gene editing it was like really new editing yes editorial yes my father works with the editorial in the hindu so yeah we know what is editorial oh, we do a lot of stuff with the text but with genes uh that is something that you do things with the text you you just delete something you just take away something it's not going to hurt but you do something with the genes you're going to hurt and it's going to hurt not just this generation it's just going to perpetuate into the progenies and into the next generation so this is something that is relatively more serious and something that we all need to have a consciousness and an awareness and not just say like oh that's the job of a biologist so when i uh, when especially uncle introduced that team the team you know i just thought uh, i was really humble uh, because i thought like uh, here is something which is so important and there's so much work going on and then you say that this is not my field oh i change domains i'm working on something else and uh, what is close to humanity is close to us and it should always be close to us be it what level of scientist you become or to which discipline you switch uh, we need to stick on to things that are close to humanity and this is yes something very close to humanity and i'm so glad that uh, madras management association has thought of doing something talking about something uh, maybe obviously these are like uh, uh, people who have been in the aviation industry and i really do not know why they would talk about this but then yes they are talking about it because it's very important to the society and uh, so i think there is something that all of us uh, we can just google it we could just have a broad uh, knowledge about what's really going on here so uh, as the theme goes you know it says like food security potential of genome editing and in food security health and surviving uh, climate change so i i just i just did a small search and i just thought that the terms were little bit not related you know like uh, genome editing oh yeah uh, we do genome editing and that is like you would have a uh, uh, disease free environment you would have uh, people who are struggling with disease with genetic disease you would be able to impact them and then you could uh, change a gene and then in that way you would be able to uh, uh, get them out of the disease yes that's very welcoming and then you go forward you look at agriculture yes you do a bit of genome editing and then you do a little bit of uh, uh, changes in the genome and like uh, uh, like the, the 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 researcher who showed just now uh, you would have uh, things produce uh, products that would be much better than what you using yes these are exciting but when you do these changes what are you changing and are you in a position to change it do you have an authority we heard a person with authority and he started doing changes and that has positively impacted the society so i saw a beautiful article you know which really uh, challenged me it said like genome editing hi fi everybody is talking about it is it a boon or is it a bane we need it's food for thought is it a boon we talking about wow you, we can do this i can do this i am superman i i am superwoman i can do this is it a boon will it be a boon maybe it can get me a few laurels but then will it be will it be something that would impact negatively the future generation is something that is a question that we need to question ourselves 
whenever we play with jeans we are not playing with toys we are not just playing with our lives we are not just playing with our with whatever is around us we are playing with stuff that could impact the progeny the future and so we need to uh, truly understand the positives and the negatives see only when you understand that there is a package and you have a lot of positives and you have also some negatives that is when you'd start uh, looking at it seriously so i i just saw this article and it's uh, it says like china's gene edited babies may be smarter amazing we all want to be smart and then it also said that this all this this one phrase you know it's a quotation it is actually a quotation this was greeted with horror by the global scientific community because dr he and his team had actually deleted a gene in the human embryo and reintroduced the embryos so this happened in china so if this is going to happen we will we will be we will have to greet this with horror this is not amazing this is not wow how could you do that yes of course this is science we are growing and we are doing great science we are doing massive science we are make we are making movements and we are progressing but what is progress what is the defining moment in progress is progress changing the stuff just for nothing so i also went through this article and then they talked about oh yes and and also dr shantasegran he also talked about doing cosmetic stuff see why would you change uh, maybe do genome editing and why would you do stuff yes to heal somebody with a serious disease which does not have an alternative of course you would do that but why would you do that just because you want to have a designer you just want to design something which would look different which would look odd so you should seriously think about stuff like that so is it a boon or a bane it completely relies in the hands of the user and as money also introduce you know like and also like when uh, uh, dr mathes when when he also uh, spoke about it we need to have serious policies not everybody should do it not everybody should take this into their hands this is not a matter that can be taken in the hands of all the public maybe just a growing or a budding artist or a scientist or a researcher this is there should be strong ground rules strong policies that should be laid uh, which people will have strong guidelines and they should have a license they should be able to uh, really understand what is going to happen when they start off something you kick off something you do a deletion you do addition you should know what is equal to what and once you arrive at that and yes you know what is going to happen fully research prove yourself to the, poly, the to the institution or the or, or whatever is the body who is going to give you the license and then you go forward so that way we will be putting a restriction and we can of course make gene editing a boon if we avoid the bans thank you thank you thank you so you raised an ethical question so on that uh, score let me uh, uh, invite uh, comments from dr chandrasekharan there are with respect to particularly with respect to gmo uh, there were issues raised with uh, in the context of uh, adversely affecting biodiversity uh, adversely affecting uh, the, you know the uh, agricultural ecological balance as uh, gmo organisms tend to produce uh, protein secretions that could actually lead to uh, death of Uh, the uh, pests or insects but then that further leads to an, a disruption in the ecological cycle and therefore biodiversity can get affected is one of the complaints the other complaint is uh, uh, of course in the genetic foods using gmo food uh, seeds could lead to allergic uh, related complications subsequently and antibiotic resistance etc and and it's some of the studies are also raising issues with respect to linkage to cancer etc so these are gmo related uh, you know complaints or observations or the negative points that are there in the context of genome uh, editing much of this should go away as i understand and much of this should not apply biodiversity should not get adversely affected and on the other hand it should actually uh, the green revolution brought about what's known as the industrial agriculture which in over 50 years now we realize it's done immense harm genome editing probably should get you back to what's known as 
uh, not, not monopolistic agriculture, but multi-diverse agricultural practices, which could lead to a greater strength of biodiversity. How do you look at that? Yeah, with regard to loss of function, that's what gene disruptions are. So that doesn't give a survival advantage to the plant. So that should not affect much, all right? Uh, when do organism, invasive organism, take over? When they have some survival advantage. When you don't have that, I don't think that will be a problem. So all these uh, gene disruption uh, or loss of function, I don't think that will be a big problem. That's my opinion. And uh, gain of function, you have to be, always be careful. Whenever you introduce, right, it's like a surgeon. The knife is in a surgeon hand, it cures people. If it is in the wrong hand, it kills people, all right? So you just have to be cautious. You have to have your rules and regulations. If people break the rules, punish them hard, right? And for ecology, I, I'm not the person to comment. I'm not. Okay. Okay. With respect to, of course, uh, you know, the survivability, genome editing will offer better survivability in the context of emerging climate change impact. Yeah, genome editing helps, uh, right? See, in classical, even if you take dog breeding, right? Uh, when you breed a particular type of dog, it takes lots of years, years and years. All genome does, editing it does, it, it accelerates the process, okay? And the mutations happen all the time in the world. When you That's walk right. out in sunlight, what do you think happens to all your... Uh, genes exposed to UV, you get a photodimer, and some of you have very good repair, you're okay. If you are, as you get older, they don't get repair, you end up with cancer. Okay, this part of life, evolution, right? So, I don't know how much, if you don't, in the wrong, any process in the wrong person's hand, very bad. But hopefully, I, I think what researchers, I consider myself as a researcher, as a scientist, our approach is to do the technique as safe as possible, okay, for using <coughs> treating people, okay. And also, if you have any one, this is why I like China has taken a bold step forward in regard to genome editing. They have accepted it. They are investing a lot of money into it. All you have to do is take the journals and look how many very nice papers are coming out of it. Because they have accepted it. And they are doing it. Just the simple thing. We have 1.4 billion people. We have to feed all of them. Okay? And let's do this. Right? I think India is not that. Actually, we are going to overtake it. Soon. Yeah, we'll be 1.6 in another yeah, 20 years. These mm. things, we have to face reality, accept and move forward. Yes, put, you have to strict guidelines, take regulations, regulations everything should be done. What my opinion is like, uh, uh, there are a few uh, questions that can be taken. If anybody has a question, please raise your hands and stand up. Yeah, this is a Quickly. very strict uh, regulatory uh, you know, organizations to, to govern, uh, take care of this, whether it is feasible to allow uh, for public usage or not, that should be done in this country. Uh, they should not restrict the researchers, uh, but uh, they should, uh, you know, uh, control them. So that's what I uh, suppose. You, you cannot also overdo. Yeah. Right? Okay. So. That's true. Thank you, Professor, and this is uh, really an interesting session, like a science fiction film, what I watched actually. My question is also more, a bit more commercial, inclined towards that. So, uh, we, I used to recently 
Uh, read, read some articles and also have, happen to watch some uh, world news, international geopolitical news. So that I, I happened to see again and again, it, there was resonating news was there. Chinese PLA is, uh, you know, very much focused on this uh, uh, genetic uh, thing and uh, they are going to bring some X-Men or Supermen and kind of, uh, I don't know whether to, how to call humans or uh, creatures for their, uh, you know, again, war capacity, to increase the war capacity. Is it something real time, you know, it is possible, is it possible somewhere in near term? Number one. Number two question is, I happen to watch the film like uh, Universal Soldier or uh, Species kind of films. Have you, in your lab, have you ever tried and it, it, it gave you a wrong result to an extent you have seen something which should, you should not supposed to see, willing to see like this? Two questions. Thank you. Any other questions? We can take one more. Yeah, please. He'll answer that. One sec. So, uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, to Professor Chandrasekharan, sir. Uh, and you, you told about like uh, we can able to, we can punish uh, those if something goes wrong or if somebody, uh, you know, overcome the limits. But what will happen like once it is released into the environment, either it is microorganism, we can't get it back. So, yeah. mistake is a mistake. Yes. I agree with that. Yes. If something released, then we can't. No, yes. can't be right. For that, you have to have all the regulations. You know, we have you know, biocontainment one, biocontainment two, but no, like COVID. Oh, okay. Right? You have those, those type of research has to be done under very strict control. Okay? Yeah. But COVID also came, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yours. Please use the mic, sir. Please use the mic. So, I don't think, like I said in the last two movies, you probably, young people should see those two movies. Gataka and uh, Voice from Brazil. Actually, Gregory Peck was an excellent actor. Uh, it's like Hitler, somebody wants to recreate Hitler, so we create a background, genetic background, and this environmental background. So go watch it. It's a great movie. And the same thing with Gataka, right? You should watch it. Uh, yeah. So right now it's not possible. Okay. You can do muscle strengthening, but it's already being done. Right? You, all you have to do is all these weightlifters, they are taking drugs and stuff. So that's already mean. To making genetic changes and doing, you cannot do it. It has to be done at the embryo level. U.S. has prohibited it. And also, I told you, challenges facing genome editing, they are real. Off target and all those things are near. It's not that easy to do. And some of the traits you are thinking about, you cannot do it by changing one gene. You have to change multiple genes, okay? So evolution had a lot of time to do all these changes and our, all organisms have come, right, survive. But you can't just go and do them in one day or two day or three day. It takes, so it will take long time to do those things. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. Yeah, anyone? Any other questions? What is your first question? Second question is the answer. Oh. Second one was species kind of film. And it gave a wrong result. And, uh, if you experience well, any results in your There was uh, one, when I first proposed the idea, NIH is a big grant. Uh, one, one of the reviewers wrote, we get our reviews back, what we tell you. So one guy said, this is, a, this is a nice idea, it won't work. But we should, he's a young investigator, we should fund it. So they funded me. Then I wrote another proposal. A few years later, after that expired, it went back to the same guy. Now I had proposed something new. He wrote back. Last time I reviewed, I said it won't work. He proved me wrong. Now he is proposing something new. I am not going to say it won't work. So give him the money. So that's US. 
That's the that's fantastic. That's right. Yeah. Any uh, anyone? Any more? Okay. Uh, just to uh, answer. Please go ahead, Doctor. I mean, Mr. Gopal. Professor, after the success of BT Cotton, it caught the attention of the people. Then immediately came BT Brinja. There was big hue and cry. Government was against it, but uh, it, it has not been stopped. It has been silently happening. Yeah. There are a lot of gene, genetically modified foods. Silently, it is being produced and it is coming to the market. Yeah. So yes, that yeah. that should be a proper management. This for a uh, adulteration, there is a check. For quality, there is a check. Whether these are all the things denied, whether whether it is flowing into the market to check, there is no agency at all. What do you say? I'll just add on to that. Much like in any other field. Now the American system works on patents and capitalist model. So Monsanto was dominating or monopolizing the BT cotton, and they would have done it in the other aspect. But Indians, being what they are, they quickly found alternate routes to take the same gene solutions. And Monsanto went to court, but they couldn't do anything. But it's dangerous because the illegal gene editing processes were coming in, and the government is aware of it. They are bringing in some kind of legislation on that. I agree. There is always people who will try to come through, right? Uh, when there is money, people do strange things. That's true here too. If you can bring it and do things, but it also comes through Bangladesh, if I'm right, right? They have no restrictions, I think. So they allow. So then the border is porous. You can get it. So, but. You can get rid of the print. It's genome editing can remove all of those. It's not that hard to do it. Thank. You. Yeah, please go ahead. Well, last question. Yeah, I am Ramesh from MMA. Uh, well, nice to see some tomatoes coming up from Pondicherry, and also heard from Mr. Mani uh, that some. Uh, Peanuts are coming up with uh, bigger sizes, uh, good for my, my pocket as well. Like that, uh, Mr. Chandrasekharan, have you come across anything substantive which is good, which is wonderful, which is uh, uh, happy to hear in your own experience as a researcher? At least three things which has actually impacted our lives in a very, very, very positive way and not like what Atesh has told in the form of coming out with some uh, demons kind of material from China kind of a thing. That's negative. Positive things, three things can you uh, say by which we can go home happily along with Judy Goba. Okay. So the talent, right? They have been used to cure cancer in two girls at least. Okay, it is, there is a newspaper article on that. Yes, so it was used to treat a blood cancer. Okay, so it's there, but they have tried more people. It works in some people and not others. Okay, that's one thing. Second of all, I think your food already you can buy all those uh, mushrooms, which is already in U.S. Like you said, a lot of them have come. Third thing, uh, they're trying to do genome editing within, without taking cells out within the body. And uh, some, you know, some people suffer from the blood defect in factor seven, factor eight, which clots blood. If you don't have it, you'll start, continue to bleed. Now they have done it in vivo, it seems to be helping. So these things are all in preclinical pre trials. They will be coming up. But definitely those two girls are fine. And recently there was another girl who was treated for sickle cell using CRISPR. She's doing fine after two years. Okay, no, uh, no problems associated with the uh, sickle cell. Yes, but like anything, 
in the beginning they are very expensive because they want to get back all the money and also this unlike us uh, i want to make it clear us is a capitalism country they want money they want they are willing to work very hard okay but they are expected in return right they want so in the beginning so they have a pattern they want to make as much money as possible within that pattern after that it so becomes what? very cheap right and but it's not their fault also it's also whoever agrees to this this wto if your government doesn't agree there is nothing they can do right but you also agree and sign the agreement so yeah so you have to negotiate with them i try to get them cheaper or, or the other way is you may have to negotiate for the whole country right as a uh, see when you negotiate with a large population then you can get it uh, it no. cheaper cheaper that's what i'm trying to say that's wonderful and uh, just to close on a final point science is always progressive it does and the and the end of the day it does good for humanity but the question that you asked is also important because you are talking about using these technology as a bio weapon and i would like to quote <coughs> plato who said 2500 years ago only the dead have seen the end of war okay so hitler when he tried to control his population to the defining the best germans and euthanasia he was actually implementing he was trying a form of control right so it's only a matter of time as he pointed out in the challenges that this will also become a weapon in the hands of few countries and few people and we got to guard against that so we were we've run out of time it's an excellent session and it's for me to thank uh, dr chandrasekharan uh, dr judy gopal and uh, dr manikandan please give them a big hand thank you very much madam thank you a yeah, marshal uh, again a fascinating you think we did this because we want to do some genome editing for each one of you to learn something keep attending mm we even lot of editing in due to your brain and lot of knowledge thanks so much and uh, i request artists to join us the president momento uh, i think viewers more than 400 people are watching thanks for joining us this evening come